All right, so good morning, everybody. <clears throat> Let us get started. So as you can see from our schedule, we've reached day three. And today, I will be talking about some of the uh, developments in spray modeling. Uh, we'll discuss first atomization and drop breakup processes in sprays, then uh, some of the momentum transfer between the droplets and the gas phase uh, in drop drag. We'll look at wall impingement, discuss vaporization models, and then, uh, if there's time, just put that all together to talk about spray modeling in general. So if you remember, <coughs> we've been talking about the governing equations, and there was always that term involving sprays as a source term in the mass, momentum, and energy equations. That's what we're going to be kind of leading up to uh, in today's uh, material. Okay, so uh, this is internal combustion engines. Uh, here's a typical uh, light-duty engine, 10 centimeter bore. Uh, the droplets in a diesel spray are on the order of 10 microns in diameter or even less. Uh, and as I mentioned, finite difference meshes in practical codes are on the order of a millimeter in size. Um, but you could see if you try to resolve down to the size of a droplet, being 10 microns, in a one-dimensional grid, you would need 10,000 grid points uh, to get down to 10 microns. And of course, in 3D, that would be 10 to the 12 grid points, which is just way beyond what is practical, uh, on, even with today's supercomputers. Um, so one needs to deal with this. And the way that um, we do this is through submodels. And basically, once you introduce a subgrid model, uh, you obviously cannot be entirely predictive in your calculation. And in fact, given the scales here, you can see that models are not going to be predictive even for decades from now. So we really have to develop accurate submodels for these processes that occur below the scale of resolution of your simulation. And these include anything happening with those droplets, the, the drag, the drop turbulence interactions, vaporization, atomization, breakup. Droplets can collide and coalesce uh, and so on. So these are things that we're going to be discussing this morning. Okay, so going back to the governing equations that we discussed last time, we have to develop equations for the gas phase and for the liquid phase, and then, of course, turbulence, since that's a reality in engines. Uh, the models that are widely used are based on the Lagrangian drop Eulerian fluid approach. And I'll show here what that means. If you take a look at a, a spray uh, that is formed by forcing a liquid through an orifice, like I'm showing in this picture here, you see that close to the <coughs> exit of the nozzle, we have a very dense spray region uh, that's sometimes classified as a, turn, a churning or thick, uh, optically thick spray. Whereas <coughs> as this uh, spray penetrates downstream, it entrains air and becomes, uh, you notice it's spreading here, becomes more dilute and eventually becomes optically thin enough that one can penetrate it, say, with a laser beam. And then downstream, after some of these droplets have vaporized, uh, you're going to have a situation where you can essentially think of it as just a, a, some particles suspended in a gas flow. So in the Lagrangian drop Eulerian fluid model concept, the droplets are tracked using a Lagrangian formulation. In other words, we follow each of the droplets, whereas the gas phase is solved on a computational mesh. And this would be a typical mesh size in your calculation. I recall that the size of the hole here is on the order of 100 microns for a diesel injector, whereas the computational mesh is on the order of 1,000 microns or a millimeter. So there is a... a a need then to resolve the physics that's happening inside this computational cell using a submodel. All right, so if we want to describe the spray, one way of doing that is to look at a probability density function that tells you essentially what's going on at any given point in your computational domain, uh, how you would characterize that spray. So at a particular location, x, the droplets here are going to have a velocity v, a vector quantity, 
uh, they're going to have sizes r, drop sizes. The droplets themselves will have some representative temperature, we call T sub D here, and all of this is happening at a certain time. So if you think of the dimensions of this, uh, to characterize this uh, spray, you need three space dimensions, three velocity, that's six, you need a size, that's seven, you need a, a temperature, that's eight, and you've got time, that's nine dimensional space. And <laughs> if you try to solve that using an Eulerian approach, you would have to solve a nine dimensional problem, which becomes com computationally extremely intractable especially when you think that uh, in each dimension you'd need at least 10 grid points and 10 to the 9, you know, that becomes a huge uh, problem. So this is the advantage of the Lagrangian approach. Essentially, we're going to follow each of these particles um, in time and then watch how they interact with the gas phase as source terms in the Eulerian uh, gas phase model. So, for instance, one of the things that will be of interest in the gas phase models is what is the gas void fraction? Uh, so, we know the gas, uh, the droplet distribution function, F, let's say. Uh, here's the volume of the drops. So, if I multiply the volume by the uh, distribution function and I integrate over the, uh, dependent, uh, the independent variables here, uh, I find that I can represent the mass of liquid or the volume of the liquid through this integral uh, and define a void fraction such that when this is zero, I have pure gas, and when this is, I beg your pardon, this part is zero, when the void fraction is one, I have pure gas, and when the void fraction is zero, I have pure liquid. So most of the Lagrangian drop Eulerian fluid spray models that exist these days and are used in uh, commercial codes uh, assume that the droplets occupy uh, zero volume. In other words, that the void fraction uh, is close to one. And this turns out not to be a bad assumption, especially far away from the injector. But even in this cell here that I've just described, you can see that since we're dealing with a subgrid scale process, there's a lot of gas in this cell. And so the assumption at that grid level, at that grid size level of a... Uh, that the droplets occupy very little volume is still not a bad assumption. The other thing that I'll talk about more on the next slide is that <clears throat> there are many, many droplets in a spray. And so uh, John Dukovitz many years ago devised a Monte Carlo approach where he said, instead of trying to track every single droplet, let's group them into parcels of drops that are all identical. So when you see a picture like this here, you can think of this as representing many droplets. So this is shown over here. <clears throat> Instead of tracking every drop, we'll track these parcels of identical drops, but each parcel contains droplets that are different, right? And they will have different sizes, velocities, temperatures from the next parcel. But stochastically, uh, you, if you uh, choose uh, enough of these parcels, you can represent a realistic spray. So how many droplets are there in a spray? So I'm just giving an example here for a heavy-duty engine where you're injecting uh, 160 milligrams of fuel uh, in one spray plume. Typically, you have maybe six spray plumes. Uh, you can work out what the mass uh, of, uh, of uh, liquid is. And then for a particular size droplet, like a 10 micron droplet, you can then determine how many of those you would need to match that mass. It works out to be about 70 million droplets in just that one spray plume. So it is impractical to track all of those droplets. And I should also mention that uh, many of the droplets are even smaller than 10 microns. I'm just taking here uh, some number for reference. So this was really the power of John Dukovic's idea here. Instead of having to track those millions and millions of droplets, we can actually track far fewer parcels of droplets on the order of thousands and still do a reasonable job at modeling. So what you will see when you look at uh, uh, graphical output is these uh, uh, representative parcels. The sizes could represent the size of the drops in each parcel. But you're not really seeing how many drops there are in each of these parcels. That, in order to do that, you would need, say, a color scheme or something like that. OK, so getting back to the gas phase now, 
let's say we knew the uh, droplet um, distribution function f, we can now calculate some of the important source terms in the gas phase uh, conservation equation. For example, for mass conservation, we saw that the rate of change of density plus the flux uh, uh, convection term uh, would be <coughs> uh, driven by your source term due to vaporization of the droplets. So for every droplet of size r, its radius is changing with time as it vaporizes, producing a source of mass uh, in the vapor phase, which has to be added to the total density of the fluid in, that, uh, in this equation. And this is gonna apply in every computational cell in our computational domain. Again, here I'm just showing you a sector mesh of a typical uh, heavy duty engine, for instance. All right, so what does this source term look like? We've got our distribution function, which we're gonna integrate over the uh, independent variables here. Uh, four pi r squared would be the surface area of the droplet times its rate of radius change. This is essentially the change in volume of the droplet with time. And I integrate over all droplets, knowing the distribution function, that gives me the source term. So <clears throat> one of the things I have to then put on my to-do list is what do I use for R here? What do I use for this uh, vaporization rate term? And we'll discuss that in a minute. Looking at the momentum conservation equation, you see there's also a source term due to <coughs> the uh, spray here. Uh, here's our rate of change of momentum in a computational cell, flux of, uh, or convection term. Pressure gradients, we have turbulent and viscous stresses, and here's our source term due to the spray. And here we're talking about momentum transfer between the droplets and the gas, and vice versa, and this appears due to uh, drag on the droplets. So we need to account for that, and so later we're gonna to have to come up with a term, uh, capital F here, which represents the drag force <clears throat> due to the droplets. Similarly, if we look at the energy equation, <clears throat> uh, this was the governing equation for the gas phase that we discussed before, we already discussed turbulence, we discussed combustion. Now we have to worry about energy due to the spray. As those droplets vaporize, they're stealing energy from the gas phase, right? The, the, uh, the latent heat has to be uh, overcome in order for the droplet to vaporize. So there's an energy transfer that we need to track. Uh, other terms here involve the standard uh, gas phase equations, the heat flux with the temperature gradient times the conductivity, and the enthalpy carried by the various species uh, with the diffusivity coming from our turbulence model. Equations of state for the gas phase are as you would have normally, uh, because remember we're assuming that droplets occupies a negligible volume here. All right, so looking at the liquid phase, <clears throat> the governing equation for the uh, probability density function uh, was formulated by uh, Foreman Williams some years ago. Uh, and basically it looks like the Boltzmann equation uh, for, from kinetic theory, except that instead of tra tracking molecules, here we're tracking droplets. So the rate of change of distribution function in this phase space involves a convection in physical space since the droplets are moving at velocity v. It involves a change in the velocity space because the droplets are accelerating or decelerating due to the droplet drag term. It involves a change in droplet size space because the droplets are vaporizing and, and uh, also heating, so in the temperature space. And then we can add as many other characteristics as we would like to this description here. Here I've shown two more variables uh, that account for the distortion of the droplets. I'll show you in a minute that Y here represents, uh, it's a measure of the size uh, distortion of the droplets from sphericity. And Y dot would be the rate of change of uh, droplet size uh, due to distortion. On the right-hand side, we have source terms because these droplets can collide and coalesce, and when that happens, a small, two small droplets become one big droplet, which changes the distribution function of sizes. 
And similarly, a, a droplet can break up into smaller droplets, which once again changes the nature of the distribution function. So that has to be accounted for. Okay, so that's basically a very general equation. And as I mentioned, in this case, we've added two more independent variables. So this is an 11 dimensional space that would be really hard to solve on a, a finite uh, difference mesh. That's where the power of the Lagrangian approach comes in. Because as you'll see, we solve this equation by looking at the characteristic equations uh, for each of these source terms, or each of these terms rather, and uh, we'll discuss that on, in the next slides. All right, so once we have the distribution function solved here, we need those uh, source terms. For example, the spray momentum equation had a, a, a force term. Uh, this is going to be calculated by considering two factors. One is, as a droplet vaporizes, and it's uh, uh, traveling at uh, velocity v here, uh, you have matter or mass leaving the droplets in a, what's called a Stefan flow. Uh, and this essentially is going to provide another um, uh, contribution to the local gas momentum, which has to be accounted for. So that's in this Fs term here. Similarly, the droplets themselves will be undergoing accelerations and decelerations, so that has to be accounted for. We call that F prime here. Uh, for the source term in the energy equation, we have to worry about the energy transfer between the uh, phases. So as the droplets vaporize at rate capital R here, that's remember d, d radius d time, their internal energy, that's the internal energy of the liquid, plus their uh, the difference in kinetic energy between the droplet at velocity v and the gas at velocity u, which is a uh, kinetic energy term, that has to be added to the gas phase or subtracted. Uh, and then here's the amount of energy required to raise the droplet's temperature, uh, the specific heat of the liquid times the droplet temperature. And then finally, there's a work term that involves the forces on the drop times the relative velocity between the droplets and the gas. And here, this U prime is the turbulent velocity. So when a droplet is in a particular turbulent eddy, one accounts for the, not only the mean flow velocity, but the, uh, the additional velocity seen due to turbulence. So these are basically source terms that are going to appear, as we saw in the uh, gas phase equation. In the turbulence equation, we also have a new term, and that uh, is basically the work done by the uh, forces on the droplets due to drag. And so that's an, another term that needs to be accounted for. Okay, so I mentioned the uh, solution method is to look at the characteristic equations from that uh, uh, equation for the distribution function. And this just shows schematically what you're doing. Imagine that one of these computational cells looks like this little box I've drawn here, and here's a droplet. And <clears throat> we're looking at it at time t. So we want to see what happens to that droplet as we advance to a new time level. Well, we know the drop position is going to change because of its velocity, okay? So the droplet is going to move to a new location at time t plus delta t uh, because of the velocity of the droplet. Now, why is that droplet velocity changing during this process? Because of drag forces on the droplet. So here we're showing droplet drag force per unit mass, which comes from those uh, terms I mentioned earlier. And while this is happening, the droplet size is also changing because of vaporization. And also, as you see in the little picture here, there's the possibility that the droplet is breaking up into other droplets. So all of these things can be dealt with by considering the uh, appropriate characteristic solutions to the partial differential equation that I showed you on the previous slide. Notice that I've also drawn here a typical eddy. Uh, the length scale of the eddy we showed last time comes from a turbulence model like the K-epsilon turbulence model. And it's also subject to a fluctuating velocity again from the turbulence model. So that's kind of the physics of moving the droplet and <coughs> uh, updating its solution to the next time level. 
The turbulence model provides the details of the length scale of the eddy and its characteristic velocity. The spray submodels will provide the force <coughs> term due to drag, the vaporization term, and then those source terms on the right-hand side, the collision and breakup and so on. Okay, so that's kind of a well-posed problem if we provide initial data. And for the initial data, we need to know, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> we need to know when we inject the liquid into the computational domain, what is the initial velocity of the droplets, what's the initial size, temperature, and so on. And this is going to come from our atomization model. Just a word on the turbulence here. I mentioned that there's a source term due to uh, the work done uh, by the drag forces. <clears throat> this is basically a work term that disperses the droplets, or in other words, allows the, the uh, cloud of droplets to spread uh, as uh, uh, due to the, the nature of the, the forces transmitted from the droplets to the gas and vice versa. That source term, W dot S here, also appears in the dissipation rate equation. Uh, so that's really where sprays come in. They do have an effect on the turbulence field as well. Uh, the rest of the terms here are the same terms you would have in a standard uh, single phase flow calculation. At the end of the day, <coughs> we use the K-Epsilon model if we're dealing with the Rance turbulence model to find the turbulent diffusivity as I mentioned, that's an important parameter for mixing. And <clears throat> to provide us with a measure of the eddy size, we'll see that that's uh, important in a minute as well. And finally, the turbulence intensity or the characteristic velocity U prime. Okay, so this uh, just shows a picture of, of a, a snapshot of a calculation that was done for a diesel, a heavy duty diesel engine. Uh, what you see here is the fuel injector located at the center on the head of the uh, combustion chamber at the center, uh, injecting six plumes of uh, sprays. Uh, in this case, the color represents the size of the droplets uh, in that location. Uh, the black regions you he see here actually are uh, the location of soot clouds uh, just for example in this calculation. And so what we would, uh, if you watch the movie of this, you'd see the spray <coughs> entering, you'd see ignition, and you'd see uh, soot production. We would follow that in time until the exhaust valves uh, open, and we would then add up the total soot in the combustion chamber and argue that that's the soot that is emitted on that particular cycle. But in order to get that far, we have to worry about how did those spray plumes break up into droplets? What was the rate of vaporization of those droplets? What is the penetration of each of these spray plumes into the combustion chamber? And then there's that whole chemistry that we spent yesterday talking about. How does it ignite? Uh, what species are involved? And so on. So it's uh, there are a whole set of models that we're going to need to discuss. And I'll just summarize some of them here. Um, from the uh, codes that we use at the Engine Research Center. Uh, and uh, this is something that we've worked on for several decades now um, in close collaboration with the authors of the original Kiva code at Los Alamos National Lab. Uh, looking at the intake flow, um, the heat transfer, we discussed this a little bit yesterday as well, uh, improvements to the turbulence models, the, today we're going to discuss these blue things here, the nozzle flow, atomization, drop breakup, wall impingement, droplet collision, coalescences, uh, vaporization, and so on. So all of these are phenomena that occur below the scale of resolution of a mesh, uh, just like we saw for heat transfer, right? The, the, the boundary layers at the vicinity of the walls are very, very thin compared to the mesh size. So you need law of the wall or other... Uh, heat transfer models. So same thing over here. To discuss droplet breakup, that's a phenomenon occurring way below the scale of resolution of the mesh, so you need a submodel for that. To, we also discussed yesterday some of the emissions and combustion models, so I don't need to talk about them. Okay, so the fuel is injected into the combustion chamber. We need to provide those initial conditions about the droplet sizes and velocities and so on. 
So we need to understand what happens when you inject a jet into a combustion chamber or into a, a vessel. Uh, so here are some pictures that came from my uh, PhD work many years ago where we uh, classified the breakup of a single jet injected through a round hole depending on parameters that include the Weber number and Reynolds number of the liquid exiting the nozzle. Uh, the plot on the left is what is termed the Raleigh breakup. This is, you see this in your kitchen sink when you let the uh, flow dribble. Uh, you'll have a column of liquid that breaks up into droplets whose sizes are actually bigger than that of the jet diameter here. And this is due to capillary instabilities due to surface tension. As you increase the velocity of this jet or increase the density of the gas surrounding the jet, what you find is that this uh, is uh, accelerated. And the reason for this is because additional forces now appear on the surface of the jet. Uh, just like on a wing of an aircraft, you have a low pressure at the crest of the waves and a higher pressure at the trough of each wave. And that helps to accelerate the breakup. And we call this the first wind-induced breakup regime. Uh, when the gas density is further increased, you see a significant change in the breakup of the jet. And now you start to see very small droplets being formed. The reason for this is now those, uh, those inertia forces that I mentioned in the first wind-induced regime now become very dominant. And in fact, surface tension now opposes the breakup of the jet. And we call this the second wind-induced regime. And you'll notice there's a glassy region of the jet near the exit of the nozzle here. If you further increase the gas density or the, the Weber number, the, the, the uh, velocity of the jet, uh, you find that this glassy region disappears. And finally, you reach what appears to be breakup occurring right at the exit of the nozzle. And for some years, there was even uh, the postulate that the liquid is already broken up when it exits the nozzle. In any case, this then we classified as the atomization regime. And here, the, this is the regime of interest in diesel engines, for instance. And uh, basically, the size of the drops are much smaller than the nozzle hole diameter. Uh, and uh, there are uh, a lot of research that's been done here. Uh, there are very well-known trends. For example, the breakup depends on the design of the interior of the nozzle. Uh, you, if you pay enough attention to rounding the shape of the nozzle, you can make even these very high velocity jets stay intact. And in fact, that's the technology that's used in jet cutting. Uh, there are machines you can buy that inject jets at 30,000 PSI um, that remain intact and they can cut materials, leather and, and other materials with just a water jet. However, if you have uh, a uh, a sharp entrance to the nozzle, as you'll see in a minute, this destroys that very well-ordered flow and you can uh, then accelerate the breakup process. So you really need to consider what happens inside the injector nozzle if you would like to uh, be able to characterize these types of sprays. And as I alluded to, uh, <coughs> cavitation is one of those phenomena that uh, is um, implicated in the improved breakup that you see as you pay attention to the design of the nozzle passage. So here's a nozzle passage. We have a reservoir of high pressure liquid here entering a nozzle with a nice uh, radius of curvature, R over D here, representing the radius of the, of the entrance divided by the diameter of the nozzle. Um, and uh, the nozzle passage has a length L what happens is the fluid separates from the corner here as it enters the nozzle passage, forming a, what's called a vena contractor, and basically a low pressure region right at the entrance to the nozzle passage. Uh, downstream, the pressure, because this is, these are subsonic flows, the pressure here has to be the chamber pressure. So there's actually an increase in pressure that occurs uh, following the, uh, the uh, the fluid particle moving through the nozzle. So <clears throat> one can uh, use experimental data to determine whether or not this separation leads to cavitation. Cavitation would occur if the local pressures are less than the vapor pressure, at least to first order. So one can compare the pressure at the exit and the pressure at the vena contractor region here. 
uh, and using criteria from the literature, determine whether or not you expect cavitating flow or not. Um, this uh, contraction coefficient comes from experiments that were done with a variety of nozzles of different uh, sharpness, as I've shown in this plot. All right, so if you just determine that you do not have cavitation <coughs> in your nozzle, then you can calculate a nozzle discharge coefficient, which is basically just uh, represents the effect of friction in the nozzle passage length of length L, and an effective injection velocity. This is the velocity of discharge of the liquid out of the nozzle, which is basically the Bernoulli velocity uh, times this uh, discharge coefficient. And the area of the nozzle hole at the exit would basically be the nozzle hole, the diameter squared times pi over four. However, if you have cavitating flow, you have the possibility that the jet actually separates from the walls of the nozzle. And in this case, the discharge coefficient depends on that contraction coefficient and also on the pressure ratios. Uh, in this case, you can calculate an effective uh, injection velocity, which is going to be different than the uh, Bernoulli velocity, but actually um, also accounts for the fact that the area of the, uh, of the jet exiting the nozzle is less than the actual area um, of the hole. Okay, so how can you uh, be a bit more quantitative? Um, there are several models for dealing with uh, cavitating flows, and one very popular one is the homogeneous equilibrium model. Basically, it assumes that you have a single phase mixture of vapor and liquid. Uh, and it considers the variable compressibility of this mixture going from the vapor density all the way to the liquid density. Uh, so one of the things of interest here is the sound speed in this uh, mixture. For the pure liquid here, this quantity uh, alpha is uh, zero. For the pure vapor, this quantity is one. And so data in the literature shows that the sound speed is a really strong function of the void fraction. Uh, obviously, it's higher in the liquid than it is in the vapor, but there is an effect w uh, over a broad range of void fractions where the sound speed is actually very, very low. And this is because those, uh, that mixture behaves basically like a compliant uh, wall tube where um, pressure waves interact with the droplets that are uh, suspended in the gas phase flow. Um, and uh, cause this uh, decrease in the, in the sound speed. With this uh, information, one can find an equation of state, uh, basically knowing how the sound speed depends on the void fraction. And using this equation of state, then one can replace the ideal gas equation of state in your simulation with this uh, equation of state that, uh, that tracks the uh, condition of the, of the fluid. So this just shows a sample simulation for a, a, a practical diesel nozzle, here you have a, a pintle that is moving, uh, that moves up and down. Uh, down would close off the passages and end the injection. Uh, you can see the pintle moving in the simulation here. We're looking at just one of the holes. Uh, if you notice uh, what happens, you can see that as the, uh, let's start over again. Okay, here we go. We start the injection, you see that Vortex, kind of like your uh, liquid going down your bathtub drain hole as you start up the injection. The colors that you see here show the velocity across this uh, duct uh, and the streamlines uh, that correspond to that. So the fluid exiting the nozzle has a velocity profile that's indicated here. If you look at the density of the fluid, you see very low density near the walls. That means we've had separation or cavitation uh, occurring uh, that affects the discharge coefficient during the injection process. Um, so that's what this uh, plot is showing you. Okay, so this type of simulation gives you information about what the boundary conditions are at the exit of the nozzle. So we've actually been spending some time trying to improve these models to account for the fact that actually in, an, in a practical injection, you also have the possibility of the chamber gas entering the nozzle uh, due to uh, a recirculating flow phenomenon. 
So the model I'm going to describe to you in a minute is from Yui Wang's PhD thesis, very recent, where he <coughs> was attempting to simulate both the flows in the nozzle and the external spray uh, in one simulation. And the idea here was to model the thermodynamic states of this compressible liquid gas mixture that's not just the vapor formed from the liquid, but also potentially the chamber gas. Uh, and to simulate flows with extremely high pressure ratios. So in a, in a diesel injector, for example, you can have pressure ratios between the reservoir and the environment uh, greater than 1,000. Uh, in order to predict the phase change, he uses the second law of Gibbs uh, free energy analysis. Uh, and then also uh, supplemented this with a model called the ELSA model, the Eulerian Lagrangian Spray Atomization Model. The idea there is we'll treat all of this as a single fluid with, uh, as I'll show you the equations in a minute, in an Eulerian construction. And at a certain moment, we'll transition the flow to the Lagrangian drop Eulerian fluid approach and create droplets downstream. The hope there is that one can account for the effect of disturbances in the nozzle on the breakup uh, of the jet and therefore the size of the droplets. So the equations that need to be solved are a little more complicated because we need separate conservation equations for the gas and for the liquid. So here are the equations of mass, momentum, and energy <coughs> for the gas phase. You'll notice they have coupling terms where the gas and the liquid velocity, the difference between them, serves as a, a source term in the gas equation and a corresponding source term in the liquid equations. <coughs> so the equations um, need to be solved to address this three-phase mixture, liquid, vapor, and air. Right? The equations of state that he chose to use are the stiffened gas equations of state. Basically, an, an equation of state that allows you to represent the vapor dome uh, for your particular liquid gas combination uh, quite accurately. Some of the details are in, in the papers that are referred to. So this shows his numerical method. Basically, you solve the fluid mechanics problem at the beginning of the time step. You just consider the case where the control volume is frozen. Um, in other words, uh, the concentrations of the, uh, the gas, the vapor, air, and the liquid in this control volume are fixed. Uh, you solve the fluid mechanics problem with convection in and out of the control volume. And then in the next step, you solve the phase equilibrium problem. You look at how, how much additional vapor has been produced from that uh, liquid, and so on, using your conservation equations. The example that I'll show you in a minute is injecting uh, from a high pressure chamber uh, liquid, 1,000 bar, into a low pressure chamber at one bar through a nozzle with diameter, what's that say, one millimeter, two millimeters, and eight millimeter length. <clears throat> so this is just a snapshot from a movie I'm going to show you in a minute. But this is the case where you inject water into water. So the density is shown in this plot here. The color scale is the water density. And just looking at that, you see the blue regions here correspond to regions where you have cavitation occurring in the jet outside of the nozzle. In other words, bubbles that are produced because of this high velocity jet. You see some evidence of uh, a decrease in density or cavitation near the walls of the uh, nozzle passage. This shows the vapor mass fraction, so in the regions where you have uh, low density, you have a lot of vapor, the pressure field, and the velocity field. So let's just look at a movie that shows the, if I can get it to run. <coughs> so first thing you see is a pressure wave that's in the bottom left, indicating the start of injection, and then as time goes by, we're at 60 microseconds now, you start to see the development of those bubble, bubbly regions in the vortex at the head of this jet that's penetrating into the, into the liquid, namely the water downstream of the nozzle passage. Okay, so a lot of the models you'll see in the literature 
uh, make the assumption of the submerged liquid jet that you see in this picture. And what I'm going to show you now is <clears throat> what happens when you treat the more realistic case where you're injecting now not water into water, but water or liquid into ambient gas. And now when you look at these pictures, this is just a snapshot of the jet, you see a completely different looking flow field downstream of the, of the nozzle. So once again, we have density here and vapor mass fraction over here. And let's look at the, uh, or oh, in the bottom plot is the air mass fraction. Let's look at the movie. <clears throat> so here you see the liquid being injected, forming a jet. Notice these interesting instabilities that form on the surface of the liquid during that initial period. And they dampen out with time. Uh, here you see the gas uh, phase volume fraction, which indicates that some of the gas is actually entrained back into the nozzle. Completely different structure of the jet than uh, we saw with the submerged jet. Okay, <clears throat> so with those nozzle flows, we get an idea of what the boundary conditions are. Now we have to deal with the breakup of the jet uh, and the formation of droplets. And so, um, again, looking at the uh, regimes that I discussed before, uh, a theory that uh, we proposed back in the early 80s uh, is called the wave breakup model. And the idea here is that this high-speed jet exiting the nozzle uh, is an unstable uh, configuration and leads to the development of Kelvin Helmholtz waves on the surface of the jet. And these can be tracked using st uh, linear stability theory which basically starts from assuming you have a cylindrical liquid jet exiting a cylindrical or circular orifice uh, into a stationary incompressible gas. And the idea is to relate the growth rate of these disturbances on the surface of the jet to their wavelength. So here's a picture of this disturbed surface. Uh, the elevation of the surface waves is eta here. The wavelength is lambda. We want to relate the disturbance uh, growth rate which we assume is of an exponential form, to the wavelength or the uh, wave growth rate, omega. The wavelength is uh, tracked using a wave number, k here, which is uh, 2 pi over lambda, the wavelength. Okay, so here's the, just a brief outline of this uh, linearized stability analysis. Uh, here's our jet, all right, we choose a coordinate system moving with the jet. Here are those surface waves uh, with wavelength uh, lambda. Uh, they're growing at a rate e to the omega t. Now I pick capital lambda and omega here just to indicate that we're really interested in the maximum wavelengths and growth rates uh, in the analysis. All right, so when this wave reaches a certain amplitude, we assume that it breaks up into a droplet whose size is somehow proportional to the wavelength of the wave through a proportionality constant, B0. Okay, and I'll introduce another uh, proportionality constant in a minute that essentially tells you when the breakup takes place. So we write the equations of, uh, mo of motion for this particular system and linearize them. We start from the continuity equation, uh, then we linearize the equations of motion, uh, momentum equations for both the liquid and the gas. And I'm just showing you them over here. These are standard uh, fluid mechanics equations. And linearized, that means that the nonlinear terms in the momentum equation are replaced by uh, essentially making an assumption that we are, uh, since we've got a coordinate system attached to the jet, that we see fluid moving at a velocity equal to the jet velocity. Uh, and then uh, attached to that is a perturbation, which gives rise to these instability waves. So everything is linearized around the jet moving at velocity capital U. Here's the radial momentum equation. And in uh, the first step of the analysis, we assume that the gas is inviscid. And it turns out this is not a bad assumption. 
but basically it means we're going to be ignoring the boundary layer in, on the guest side of the interface and just assume that we have uh, essentially the uh, jet velocity uh, at the interface. Uh, if you make the assumption that the disturbance, wavelength, the disturbance height is much less than the radius of the jet, which is called A here in this analysis, uh, you can show then that the pressure in the gas, uh, P2 here, depends on the jet velocity, U, the gas density, and then a term that arises because of the capillary uh, wave uh, velocity, the surface wave height, and then the wave number, which remember I said is the inverse of the wavelength, and some Bessel functions. So. The, these equations then are supplemented by boundary conditions. We have a kinematic condition that says that the uh, rate of increase of uh, elevation of a wave on the surface uh, must be equal to its velocity at the surface. And here we have the tangential boundary condition, which basically came from saying that the viscosity in the gas was zero. Um, and so that uh, provides a, a condition on the stresses, the tangential stresses. And then finally, the most important equation is the normal stress balance at the interface, where on the left-hand side, we have the terms that cor correspond to the uh, liquid side, the pressure in the liquid, the viscosity in the liquid uh, times the gradient. So this would be a normal stress due to viscosity. The surface tension effect, sigma being surface tension, A, remember, is the radius of the jet. And then, uh, sorry, the last term on the left-hand side is the gas contribution, which is this pressure in the gas, the dynamic pressure in the gas. Okay, so if you solve that equation, you uh, can derive this messy-looking dispersion relationship, which relates the growth rate of instabilities on the jet to the wave number or wavelength of those waves. And it has terms involving the liquid viscosities, the surface tension, and the dynamic pressure. Remember that F for that airplane wing example that I gave you? The dynamic pressure on the surface of the jet. So one can solve this equation <coughs> with suitably normalized and show that the growth rate varies with wavelength such that there is a maximum in the, gr in the wave growth rate for any given Weber number, Weber number based on the gas density here, and what's called Unsorgen number, which is basically a ratio of the, uh, it, 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 it looks at the fluid uh, uh, viscosity, so it's a Reynolds number and a Weber number. And so for inviscid fluids, it's equal to zero, and here you can see as you increase the Weber number, you increase the maximum wave growth rate, and at the same time, you reduce the wavelength of the most unstable waves. Uh, if you now look at a case uh, where you increase the, uh, the viscosity, that's comparing this curve and this dotted curve, you see a big decrease uh, in both growth rate and uh, wavelength. So viscous effects uh, are important. So <clears throat> what uh, these equations show is just looking at those uh, maximum wavelengths and growth rates and correlating them with the parameters of the problem, the uh, Onsorgen number, the Weber number and the gas, the gas phase and the liquid phase and the Reynolds number. Combine them into a parameter called the Taylor number. These are the correlations that uh, appear. And you can use them then to actually monitor the, uh, the various parameters. So here we're looking at, this is, uh, uh, sorry, that's kind of small. This is wavelength, and this is growth rate, yeah. So this is the wavelength as a function of the gas phase Weber number, and this is the growth rate as a function of the gas phase Weber number. And you can see the effect of viscosity as I increase the Onsorgen number. I uh, actually uh, cause longer wavelengths and as I increase viscosity, I reduce the growth rates. Okay, so that's the model, <coughs> the, uh, the, the details of the model. So how do you implement that in a, in a simulation? So this is a piece of the jet exiting the nozzle. Uh, here are those growth rates 
omega and wavelengths that we've just calculated from those dispersion relation uh, equations. Uh, it turns out that we are going to assume that the size of the droplets is, as I said, proportional to the wavelength. And then the growth rate here is used to determine when the breakup occurs. And so by multiplying this uh, omega here by another constant, we can essentially control in our model when we release the droplets from the jet. Uh, we can also estimate the angle of divergence of the spray because we know the vertical velocity of, the, of these growing waves. It's just omega times lambda. And so we find that the, uh, the wave uh, leads to a dispersion or a cone angle that is actually proportional to the square root of the density ratio of the, liquid, of the gas and the liquid. There's a parameter here that's a function of Taylor's number uh, in the prediction. But for <coughs> most sprays of interest, diesel sprays, the Taylor number is very large. So basically, you can replace this with a constant, square root 3 over 6. That tells you that the cone angle is pretty much independent of viscosity uh, and only depends on the density ratio between the gas and the liquid. Now, as you break up this jet, you're stripping away droplets. You can show that the breakup length, that would be from the nozzle exit to the point where there's no more liquid, it's all been converted into droplets, breakup length, scales with the inverse of that density ratio, namely the liquid density over the gas density, square root. Uh, again, this function f here is just a constant, uh, times the radius of the nozzle. So the important parameters really are uh, the, is really the gas liquid density ratio. So if you inject a high velocity jet into atmospheric <coughs> air where the gas density is low, first of all, it doesn't break up very much. The spreading cone angle is very small and the breakup length is very long, right? That's why uh, diesel sprays are so effective because in the diesel engine, the density of the gas is very high. You've compressed with a 16 or 18 to one compression ratio Densities are high, and you see uh, breakup. So this was all theory, and uh, 30 years ago, uh, more recently, there's been some interesting uh, developments that I uh, was uh, very interested to see. Because if you look at a diesel spray, and I showed you some pictures earlier, it's impossible to tell what's actually happening inside the spray. Where at uh, Argonne National Labs, they have available the synchrotron uh, system that allowed them to, using x-rays, explore what was happening inside a diesel spray. And here are some results for a, a nozzle with a fairly nice rounded inlet here, hydroground nozzle, for a particular fuel, a biofuel here, where they examined what happens when you change the injection pressure from 50 to 100 megapascal. Uh, and observe using phase contrast imaging the, the uh, nature of the disruption of the, of the jet. And in the uh, X-ray images, you can kind of see evidence of these uh, waves uh, growing and eventually breaking up uh, into uh, droplets. So there's a lot of discussion about what you're actually seeing uh, in these images. And Professor Lai here is an expert. He was actually involved in taking these images. Uh, and so at the break, maybe you can ask him what it is we're actually looking at. But I took this as an encouraging uh, result that supports the idea of surface waves being involved in breakup. Uh, additional evidence of this is work being done by Professor Trio at the uh, Engine Research Center, who uses DNS simulations and volume of fluid methods to track the liquid and what happens to it as it's uh, injected into the combustion chamber. Uh, and his simulations also show evidence of these uh, growing instabilities on the surface of a jet, eventually leading to droplets. So <clears throat> these calculations are done on, in parallel computing on supercomputers, and this is probably a month's worth of computing that you're seeing here. This is uh, five or 10 minutes of computing using RANS models. 
Uh, and so this is the approach that I'm discussing today, the Lagrangian drop Eulerian fluid approach. You inject your droplets, you apply the uh, correlations that I just showed you to determine the droplet sizes at breakup and the droplet, um, the breakup time, and model the spray. Professor Rutland in our group is kind of combining the ideas here and looking at large eddy simulation and developing uh, models that are somewhere in between direct numerical simulation and RANS. Uh, so there is a significant amount of e effort in the community to try to improve these spray models. Okay, um, <clears throat> so the last thing I just want to mention is the ELSA modeling approach that I alluded to earlier. Uh, again, this is from Yuri Wang's thesis work. And the idea here is that you can take a DNS simulation and use it to determine basically what the liquid air surface area would be as you move downstream. So in the region near the nozzle, the surface area is going to be very much similar to that of a round jet. But because of those growing waves and so on, the surface area is increasing with distance downstream. So one can model that by using a, by introducing a, 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 a conservation equation for liquid air surface area, where sigma here is the surface area per unit volume. And this is very similar to the model that's used to model flame uh, surface area in some of the uh, uh, combustion models that you may have heard of. Okay, so we have source terms, again, that represent the growth of the surface uh, area due to effects due to surface tension. You notice the Weber number appears in here. And there's some constants which you can tune to make these two models look quite similar. So having tuned that model, you can track the surface area <coughs> as uh, part of your continuum uh, Eulerian uh, solution. And at a certain moment when the surface area reaches some critical threshold, transition to the Lagrangian droplets, as I mentioned uh, before. And then this slide here just shows an example of that from Yui's work. So here we're looking at a sharp edge nozzle and here a rounded edge nozzle, you're injecting into your ambient gas. Here you have the Eulerian formulation that basically con consists of uh, a single phase, but with very, uh, density variations, you're predicting cavitation here with a sharp corner, you don't see much of that with the rounded corner. And then tracking the surface uh, area with your, um, the equation I showed you on the previous slide, at a certain moment you transition the liquid from single phase to a two phase problem by introducing droplets. So that's uh, a very interesting idea that's being pursued by a number of people um, these days. The whole idea here is to try to include effects due to the disturbances introduced in the nozzle in your spray model without having to specify constants or too many constants um, as part of your initial conditions. Okay, so after the break, I'm going to talk about uh, drop breakup. So we've atomized the liquid, we've made these droplets, now they're going to break up and droplets can, uh, can collide and coalesce and so on. We'll talk about that. Questions about this? Yeah. Um, one question is, have you seen this uh, Yeah, so you notice in the simulation I showed um, right at the beginning of the nozzle flow, right at the end, uh, you can actually see, uh, I wonder if I can quickly show that here. Um, let me see, that would probably be. Uh, where did I have that? Ah. Uh, Sorry. Here we go. 
the, right at the end of this uh, simulation, as the needle is seating, uh, you see spikes here. <coughs> this is uh, the density at the nozzle exit here. Um, it becomes pretty chaotic, and there's a big drop in injection velocity, which would lead to poor atomization, which would then lead to big droplets being predicted in the model. Uh, however, in a practical injector, you can have bouncing occurring, like this needle seeding can actually bounce. And I think that's probably a more important phenomenon, um, because there, you each with each bounce, you squeeze out a little bit of liquid. Plus, some of the more recent work at Argonne shows that during that bounce period, you actually suck air back into the nozzle. So it's quite a complicated flow. Sure, sure. Yeah, so right now we have, uh, uh, for example, most recently we've looked at soot formed from films on, on liquid surfaces uh, in a gasoline direct injection engine. And the concept there is that you essentially still have vaporization, so you, you are going to the vapor phase, but there's no oxygen in the environment because maybe a flame has already passed by consuming the oxygen. So basically you have a pyrolysis process that creates those precursors, the, uh, the PAHs, which then drives the soot model. So that's the only connection. Uh, in reality, though, this liquid phase pyrolysis, which I think is what you're alluding to, uh, that could also lead to deposits and soot, and that's not in these models. Okay, uh, so we will meet at 10 o'clock, so we have 12 minutes.